Hello and welcome to Pick Yourself, the podcast that helps you build and grow your electronic music career. You will learn the strategies, mindset, tactics and tools that you can implement today to break through tomorrow. My name is Philip. Now let's get right into today's episode. Hello, new week, new podcast. I'm super happy to have you here with me again. And I don't know what the weather is like in your place right now, but in Berlin, in the moment that I'm recording this, it's extremely hot. There have been thunderstorms every single day. And today is the same. I'm here trapped in my studio and there's super nice weather outside and I would love to go for a swim. But you know what? I think it's more important to bring you a new episode. So here it is. This episode talks about the best release promotion strategy for electronic music. So you are going to learn the exact release promotion strategy that I have been recommending to my clients over and over again. And it has proven to work for quite a lot of people. So they have been following the steps that I had recommended before. And the release of EPs and albums and even singles... It got way more attention than they had believed to get in the first place. And just to make it easier to remember and to follow, I'm calling this the SMO strategy. And what does that stand for? So the three first letters stand for story, momentum and outreach. I believe that story, momentum and outreach are the three key ingredients that you should follow when designing your own release strategy for electronic music. But before I get into the exact meaning of the three words, story, momentum and outreach, let's talk a little bit about what the real problem is here with release strategies. So the typical do-it-yourself release or release on a small net label works like this. Months and months of hard work have passed by, countless hours of studio time, creative night shifts and the whole emotional roller coaster with many ups and downs along the way. And at the end, you're exhausted, but you're also super proud. Because finally, all the songs are written, the artwork is done, and it's time to let the precious piece of art that you've developed be discovered by the public. And your release promotion strategy is more or less like this. So you, or your distributor that you're working with, are uploading the songs to Beatport, SoundCloud, YouTube, Spotify, all the other platforms... And you're putting together that one magic Facebook and Instagram post, which you even boost with $50 of ad spend. And then you hit the publish button. You've done your homework and you even send some free promos to your DJ buddies and some of your idols as well. And hope that your songs are going to be the next hymn on whatever big festival. And then happens nothing. I mean... Yes, you probably get the first few hundred plays, but after that, this initial spark of attention fades into complete silence. So what went wrong with the release promotion strategy? Well, it all comes down to one big issue here. There hasn't been any real release promotion strategy to begin with. So you should have invested some time into planning your release months before the actual release date. And this last-minute activism that a lot of people fall into when they're still upcoming, this doesn't help you anymore. It's already too late. And that brings us to the question, what can you do better next time? So every great release promotion strategy, in my opinion, starts with the right timing. Timing is one of the most important factors when it comes to the music promotion in general. And my recommendation with releases is that you should start planning your promo phase when more or less 50% of the songs of your EP or album are finished and done. This is the sweet spot because on the one hand, you have a pretty good idea of what the end product is going to sound like. And on the other hand, you still have enough time to properly plan and execute your release promotion strategy. But what usually happens instead is that upcoming artists tend to fall into this perfectionism trap that they think, oh my god, my whole concept isn't done yet, I haven't written all the songs and I haven't put enough thought into the concept behind my music. Another cheap excuse would be, well, I just 
don't want to dedicate the energy into the promo because I want to reserve all this energy for creating music. And I call this a cheap excuse because you cannot create music all day, that's just, that's just plain bullshit, it doesn't work. And I'm quite sure that there is some time available that you could dedicate to the promo planning. Because it's also a very different type of work, it doesn't require that much creativity compared to creating music. It's not that hands-on, it's a little bit more thinking and writing and stuff like that, organizing. That's a different task. I believe that everybody should reserve a little bit of time and energy for that part. Therefore, I believe it's crucial to set aside a few hours per week to work on your promo plan on top of your studio time. And I know this can be a pretty tough phase, especially when you have a full-time job or something like that at the same time. But this is a make or break scenario, so if you don't do this, your release will fail, it will crash dramatically. And just to make one thing clear, the implementation of your release promotion strategy also starts already while you're still working on your songs. And sure, Aphex Twin can put out an album just out of the blue and everybody will notice, but you can't. You are not Aphex Twin, I promise. Your job is to involve your audience pretty early on. And how can you do this? How can you make sure you gain enough attention and you keep on building that suspension while you're still in the studio, grinding out songs for your release? Now this is where my SMO release promotion strategy can help you. So I've noticed some patterns among my most successful studio clients when it comes to their release promotion strategies and also the labels that I work with, what they do is they all use three key components that I identified. It is story, momentum, and outreach. So let's first talk about story. So it might be old news to you that storytelling is a really important component of contemporary electronic music promotion and marketing. But at the same time, I don't see a lot of that being implemented by upcoming artists, and that makes me wonder, it's such a low-hanging fruit, it's so easy to do this and to gain a little bit of advantage and to gain some traction with your audience. And I've stumbled upon an article by Music Think Tank, which is another blog, and they have come up with six aspects that play a role when implementing storytelling in your music promotion strategy. So I'll just quickly walk you through them. So first of all, stories are memorable. So just remember the last time somebody told you about an artist who did something super strange on stage or played that one strange combination of tracks, mixed this one into that one and then put some Latin percussion on top of it, whatever the story was, I'm dead sure that you remember the story, but probably you won't remember even the artist's name or the name of the tracks that they've played. But yeah, the story sticks, so that is something to think about. If you have a memorable story to share with your music, then this already gives people a reason to remember you. Next on the list, stories are newsworthy. And that means that if you provide a good story alongside your artist profile or your music, your EP that you put out or your album, that gives blogs and journalists and music magazines a reason to write about you or another reason to write about you beyond the music itself. And it makes it easier to create a nice article, a nice feature and to ask the right questions in an interview. The next thing is stories humanize and build deeper connections. And that is pretty cool because people can probably relate to your story. They can identify with you in a way and that helps deepen the connection between you and your audience. And therefore, and that's the next point, it can create evangelists or ambassadors for whatever you do. So your story, if it's super relatable and people can identify with that, your audience can identify with that, they probably want to tell that story to their friends and the friends of their friends and so on, simply because they believe in whatever you're after. The next thing on the list is they leave us wanting for more. So if that story manages to leave a bit of curiosity in there, like a little question mark, then we want to follow up with that. That's like you're watching a series and they leave you with a cliffhanger. Well, of course you want to know what happens in the next episode, so you keep on watching. The last point on the list of Music Think Tank is that stories cannot be untold. 
And that is a little warning here, because if you are telling the wrong story to your audience, then it might be able to damage your reputation. And it's super hard to fix that. So let's take a step back now and think about what is the story that you should tell your audience. And I believe this is different in every case. Let's say you're interested in artificial intelligence and your EP explores this topic from an artistic side. And then there is somebody else, another artist, who maybe finds him or herself in the middle of a personal transition. For example, starting from scratch in a new city. And this is heavily influencing the songs that they're writing. This can also be a great story to tell. But whatever the story is, I don't think it's important if it's a made-up story or if it's something personal. I just think that it should be rooted deeply in your interests and your passion and your personality. So it should just feel true and authentic to who you are and what you want to express as an artist. So let's move on to the second part of the SMO strategy. And this is the M, which stands for momentum. And what do I mean with momentum? Momentum basically means keeping in touch with your audience and building an arc of suspension until the final release date. That includes holding this climax of attention for a few weeks after the release. And I think momentum is such a vital part of any good release promotion strategy. So how can you implement this? You can imagine momentum like a snowball that, first of all, it starts super small and then when it runs downhill, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And this snowball, this little snowball, starts way before the actual release phase. It starts while you're still in the middle of working on your release. So you share some little videos and snippets, and give people a look behind the scenes of your studio days. And you can even use your social channels as a sort of diary. I believe it's even more powerful when you're sharing the ups and the downs in that process. So if you're stuck in writer's block, for example, why not post about it? I mean, that makes you so approachable and so relatable, people really can identify with you. Probably among your fans you have some, well, heavy music consumers or people that are interested in production themselves. So this look behind the scenes can be absolutely valuable for them. And also being honest about it, about the drawbacks, about what you're sacrificing for all those studio days. Sharing these kinds of stories can be something that helps you build momentum. But of course, there's also an alternative approach to this. So if this whole approachable, relatable image doesn't really suit you as an artist and doesn't suit your artist brand, you can take a more mysterious approach. You can leave obscure photos and videos and quotes and little sound snippets that just hint at something that's coming. So this route is completely fine, but it's a bit trickier to implement because you can only play this game for so long until your audience gets bored. So you have to be very, very creative with it. You have to have good ideas on how to build this arc of suspension. But it's possible. The most important thing is consistency here. So whatever path you choose, don't forget that it takes some time to gain momentum. Consistency is more important than what exactly you are sharing with your audience. Believe me, nothing is more irritating than an artist who shares loads of things in one week, but then completely vanishes in the next one, and then appears again, and then vanishes again. And therefore, it's a good idea to create a posting plan for your release phase and also the production phase, because that helps you stay on track. And if you also set calendar reminders that basically tell you, hey, you still have to post today, don't forget, that is a major little helper that you can implement. So if you use Google Calendar or iCal or any form of digital calendar, that works absolutely fine. It's super easy to implement and I can only suggest you do this or at least try it out for the next release. So some of you might be thinking, well, I don't need to do this because I'm posting every day anyway. So this momentum part is already, well, the box is ticked. I don't think so. Because the people that are usually posting on a daily basis don't follow a dedicated storyline. But that's the big difference here. Because the momentum part of it only works if the story is already consistent. And if we then tell the story over an extended period of time frequently and consistently. 
So let's move on now to the third part of the SMO strategy, and that is outreach. So outreach means getting in touch with blogs, magazines, and other DJs and producers that might want to play your tracks in their sets. And it's simply not enough to rely on your own existing audience and the DJ contacts and maybe some blogs that you already have. You have to go the extra mile here and reach out to people so your audience grows with every new release. This is probably the most difficult but also the most rewarding part of this release promotion strategy. And just to make this clear, I think there is no point in reaching out to other audiences if you haven't put some energy before into crafting a consistent story and building some momentum. Because this whole SMO strategy, that only works when all three ingredients work together, because they feed into each other. And this also holds true for the other two parts of the SMO strategy. So if you have a story, but you're unwilling to build this momentum and to also do some outreach, well, you just created a story for basically nobody, because only some existing fans are interested in that, but you're not winning anything out of that. If you only build momentum, but you don't want to outreach and you have no consistent story, well, what type of momentum do you want to build here? It's basically not happening. And it's the same for outreach. Outreach only makes sense if you have the story already in place and if you're already gaining some momentum within your existing audience. But let's come back to the outreach. When we're speaking of outreach, we have two different aspects of that. We have the media outreach, which means blogs and magazines, and we have artist and DJ promos. So let's take a look at both. First of all, outreach to blogs and magazines. Well, outreach overall works best if you build meaningful relationships with people months before the actual release date. So cold contacting them a week before your EP comes out, that will most definitely not work because people are flooded in their inboxes with emails of artists just like you that want to get a little piece of the cake and a little bit of attention. And in my opinion, with the whole relationship building thing, and I will also do an episode on that, I think that quality is way more important than quantity. There's no point in buying an electronic music blog promotion list somewhere online if 90% of that list is either outdated are completely irrelevant for your type of music and you haven't built a real relationship with them. So a better approach is to start digging for blogs and magazines that are definitely in line with your style of music. And you have to do the hard work here. You have to scroll through the internet and find the sites that are relevant for you and your style. And you have to be brutally honest. If you produce techno and stumble upon a really cool blog that specializes in deep house, there is no way that they are going to feature you on their site, no matter how big they are or how great it would be to be in front of their audience. So here's what you can do. You can look for 30 to 50 blogs and magazines worldwide that are truly relevant in your niche and for that style of music that you're playing. Then you select the 10 most important ones on that list and you try to build some sort of relationship months before the release. It's super important that you don't ask for anything. You simply start showing interest on their social channels, you comment on articles on their site, and you try to become some sort of a known face. And this usually works better with smaller sites than with the big ones. But uh, lots of bloggers and journalists are digging for new stuff on the small niche blogs. So even if you get featured on a small site first, there's still a good chance that the bigger ones will pick it up later. And this overall approach works best if you can establish a sort of online relationship with specific writers rather than the general editorial team. So try to find individual people's official email addresses and simply leave a short compliment or thank you note for an article that they've written. Then you try to keep in touch from time to time. So when it comes to your release, you're already a known name. And when that moment comes, so in the hot phase of your release, a couple of weeks before the official release date, you have to have your shit together. So your electronic press kit, EPK, should be absolutely flawless and super well organized. So what is an EPK? I will probably also do an episode on that because it's uh, something super important in its own right. An EPK, electronic press kit, usually contains your EP, album, 
as a streaming link as well as a high-res download. The official artwork in high resolution as well as online optimized. New artist photos in high resolution as well as online optimized. Your up-to-date artist bio. A press release with background information about your EPR album. And if you have anything else like videos or other promo material that they can embed, also share this with it. The most important rule here is you have to make it as simple as possible for the bloggers and journalists to get all the information and resources that they need. So the email that you're sending should only contain like a very short and personal message together with the link to your music and everything else should be packed into some sort of link to a cloud storage. So Dropbox, OneDrive, whatever. So photos, artwork, bio, long version of the press release, all these things, they should be stored in a cloud storage link that you can enter into the email as well. So you just don't overcrowd their inbox with loads of documents. And please make sure that you name everything properly, that people find what they are looking for. You just put yourself into the shoes of the person that's writing the article. You want to make it as easy as possible for them to get every information and every resource. That sometimes makes the difference between an article getting published or, well, just neglected. And just a quick note about outsourcing here. So nobody wants to use a photo that looks like shit and nobody wants to use parts of an artist's bio that just sounds silly. So it might be a good idea if your release is really important to you, to invest a little bit of money into hiring a photographer who's specializing in artist profile shots or getting somebody to help you write a proper artist bio and press release. These things can make a lot of sense when you want to do the outreach thing. You can also outsource the whole outreach. You can give it to a promo agency, to a PR specialist. And I think this can be a good investment because they've already built meaningful relationships with bloggers and journalists and it's easier for them to get into yeah, the editorial team and work with them. But on the other hand, you have to make sure that you only hire people that either have been recommended by people that you trust or that already have a certain standing in the electronic music industry. And that also, that standing comes with a certain price tag. So it's not easy to find somebody that is actually doing great work they are out there and i can only recommend trying it out but if you're just on at the moment where you're starting out and you're not sure if you want to outsource the whole thing i suggest at least getting good photos and having somebody help you with the written stuff if that isn't super easy for you okay let's now talk a little bit about outreach to other djs and other producers so this is a tricky one because it's super hard to give a general recommendation. I mean, of course, you can buy yourself into a professional DJ promo pool. And for some upcoming artists, this has worked extremely well. For others, it has done nothing at all. So what I would do in this situation is I would at least try it on a couple of releases and see what the response is like. And if the response is super positive and you get a lot of like really in-depth feedback and some a little bit more known artists actually find out about you, then I think it's worth the expense and it's worth continuing with it. But if not, um, then it's probably the wrong type of promo pool or it's not something that generally works for your music. Maybe it's just a little bit more left field what you do and not suitable for the traditional club promo pool. And that's completely okay if that's your style. Then it doesn't make sense to use a well commercial DJ promo pool. But apart from that, I definitely encourage you to build your own personal promo pool of artists that are in line with your taste. And in order to build your own promo pool, I think it's a good idea to go beyond your existing contacts and just simply get in touch with people online, other upcoming artists that haven't had their real breakthrough, but that somehow fit your style and they fit your taste. And I would write to them. I would tell them that you like their music a lot and if it's possible to start something like exchanging promos. And slowly you are expanding your presence in this underground scene and you grow together. So, of course, you can also send your music to Richie Horton, but I don't know if he's actually going to react to that. So I think it's a good idea to 
send it to people at your level as well that are maybe playing a lot, that are building reputation in the industry. And if you help each other, if you start to play each other's music, only if you authentically like what the other one is doing, then it makes a lot of sense. That creates some sort of momentum. And if you're then starting your own promo pool, make sure you make everything super convenient for people. That means streaming possibility, downloads as high-quality MP3s, as well as AIFF files or WAF, whatever. Just offer people to download the music in the way that they like to play it. Already everything named properly, everything arranged properly. Just make sure that everything's suited for actually playing it in the club. Okay, so let's recap the SMO release promotion strategy. That is story, momentum and outreach. And all three parts have to work together because they work as a system that feeds into each other and that grows beyond the sum of its parts. And when you now want to create your own personal release promotion strategy, make sure to consider that it starts now and not in a few months. So you've learned about the SMO release promotion strategy. You can implement this in a way that works for you on your next EP or album. You can tweak it, of course, to your taste. But as I've mentioned, time is a crucial factor. So even if you haven't planned your next release yet, I highly encourage you to start building your blog and magazine list as well as your personal promo pool. And the earlier you start building these lists, the easier the promo for your next release will feel. So also here, slow and steady wins the race. That's just true for music promotion strategy as well. And building meaningful relationships with people and with the right type of influencers in your niche, this is a key ingredient to success here. And you have to start this now and not a few weeks before your release day. And there's one more thing I want to mention about paid ads. Because some of you might be wondering why I haven't mentioned Facebook and Instagram ads or banners on media sites and blogs. Well, I left them out purposefully out of the SMO strategy because I don't believe that they are a vital part of the method. I mean, it doesn't hurt to amplify your efforts with paid ads, but I'm overall convinced that you're only burning money if you don't put enough into story, momentum and outreach to begin with. And only if these three parts are executed properly, then it can make sense to amplify your efforts with paid ads. But okay, let's assume you have done everything else correctly. Does it still make sense to invest in ads? Well, yes and no. Because I wouldn't use ads to get in front of new audiences. This is super hard. I would suggest to invest some budget into getting your posts in front of your existing fans and basically feed your tribe with the things that you're putting out. Because they are your natural ambassadors and it's super clever to make sure that they notice your upcoming release. And it might also be good to do some kind of paid collaboration with one of your top 10 key blogs and magazines. Something like a track premiere or yeah, some kind of collaboration that puts you in the spotlight and that still has some journalistic value to it as well. So there's no way to just buy yourself in front of the right people. There has to be an organic fit first but then ads can amplify the impact of that. So as usual, I'm giving you three distinct action steps that you can take right now after this episode to start implementing the things that we talk about here. So how can you design your next release promotion strategy based on the SMO approach that we've been talking about here? Well, the first action step is to start building relationships with bloggers, journalists and other DJs and artists in your subgenre, simply to grow your influencer list for the next release. And how do you do this? You set aside a dedicated time slot every single week to interact with these people and nurture meaningful relationships and build them. Then you also collect a list of 30 to 50 blogs and magazines that truly fit your style. And then you select your top 10 sites where you put most effort and focus into. And you start building your own promo pool and you start exchanging promos with other producers that are about to blow up but still underground. So you look for people that fit your style, where you're deeply interested in their music and you think that they might be interested in your music. 
And as always, quality is more important than quantity here. So you want to focus on artists that actually fit very, very well, even if it's just a couple of people every week. Action step number two, you set a release date for your next EP or album right now and you start scheduling your release promotion strategy. So how do you do this? You write down story ideas that resonate with you and the music that you're currently working on. You collect ideas on how you can gain momentum and create an arc of tension until your release comes out. And you start putting together some kind of posting plan for the last weeks leading up to your release. And you set calendar reminders to help you keep on track with that. And action step number three, set aside a little budget for external outsourcing of specific tasks that have to do with your electronic press kit. So whether it's photography or copywriting or hiring a PR specialist, you will have more impact if you work together with other professionals. And only if everything else is already checked off, then you can consider investing some budget into track premieres or other types of features on your top 10 blogs or magazines, as well as boosting your social media profiles among your existing audience. I think that makes sense. All right, so to wrap this episode up, I hope it was helpful to you. The SMO strategy with story momentum and outreach has worked for a lot of artists in the past. And I think you should just try it out and tweak it to your needs and see what works for you and what doesn't. And I would be super interested to know what you have tried in the past and what has worked for you, what hasn't worked for you. So you can leave a comment at pictureshalfpodcast.com. I read everything, I probably answer everything, and I'm super curious to find out what you are actually doing in your real life when it comes to release promotion strategies. And since my overall goal with this is to help you build and grow a meaningful electronic music career, I have put together a free resource that might help you on the way. And I've called it the 7 Strategies of Highly Successful Electronic Music Artists. And this is a free PDF where I have collected some ideas and habits that have helped my most successful studio clients grow their audience and build a music career. And you can download this for free at pickyourselfpodcast.com slash free. Once again, pickyourselfpodcast.com slash free. If you have enjoyed this episode, please make sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app. And you can find show notes to this episode in form of a detailed blog post at pickyourselfpodcast.com. Until then, see you next time.